Okay, good morning everyone. Morning. Thank you so much for joining us here today on this little bit wet Sunday morning early. Uh, some of you might have gone to the um, Georgian host reception last night and enjoyed that. It might have been difficult to, to get up. Uh, so we very much appreciate you to be here with us today. Uh, we have one hour here for this uh, panel session on enhancing uh, safeguards. And what we want to look at, um, we've been having a lot of discussion about safeguard policy. Uh, we know that we need to have a, a better safeguard policy, but how do we go from policy to implementation? I mean, that's really where it matters in the end, right? Making sure that whatever goes into policy is actually implemented. And that's not so easy. And neither is my computer, which just decided to shut down. Just give me mo one moment. There we go. Uh, so, yeah, nothing goes perfect. And I guess that's one of the messages that we'd like to talk about today. Um, with our panel members, which I'll introduce in a moment, I think what we'll be discussing today is a number of quite challenging projects that have been implemented with the support of the Asian Development Bank. We're trying to, of course, implement projects that support sustainable development. And you'll hear about regional connectivity, you'll hear about renewable energy, you'll hear about roads. Uh, but of course, we need to balance environmental and social safeguards with that. And I think from the ADB, we do aspire to implementing international good practice with the projects that we support. Um, but of course, as we've heard this week, and, and I've been joining many of the panels with civil society and meeting quite a number of you bilaterally, there's certainly challenges on the ground. And a number of the projects that we will be talking about today have experienced those challenges. Um, and I am pleased that they are all trying to move through that, to learn through that, and also implement good practices. So I think what we'll be hearing about today is a number of these projects and what they've been learning. Um, and I hope after the panel discussion we'll have some time uh, to also hear from you. Uh, now, of course, I'm very pleased to welcome our panel members. Uh, before I do introduce them individually, though, there's a little bit of uh, just housekeeping that I need to, to go through. Uh, I'll introduce myself first for those of you that don't know me. Uh, my name is Bruce Dunn. Um, I'm Director for Policy and Technical Services in the Office of Safeguards, and, and our team uh, has been working on the new environmental and social framework for the ADB. Uh, for the program today, uh, we'll introduce the panel in a moment. Uh, we'll then introduce um, uh, the... Uh, sorry, first uh, I'm going to... Uh, tell you a little bit about uh, Pigeonhole that we'll be using for uh, some of the session q and I think many of you will be familiar with that. Uh, we'll also have a short video. Uh, we'll have some discussion with the panel members. Uh, and then towards the end of the hour, we'll have, uh, you know, hopefully 15 minutes or more from some questions from the audience. So, um, next, uh, I just uh, remind you about the Pigeonhole uh, that we've been using for the q and uh, If you haven't used it yet, please do scan the QR code. Uh, that will allow you to uh, put questions online. Um, it's you know, fairly simple and interactive mobile website. Uh, you can submit your questions to the panel. Uh, you can also vote on any of the questions that other people have uploaded that you like. Uh, and I'll do my best during the session to basically take the ones uh, where we have uh, the most, most likes or the most interesting questions available. Uh, you can access it through your internet browser, of course, also through your mobile. Um, you can uh, use the passcode. You can see there's a passcode that is there on the screen, uh, Tbilisi 2024. Uh, now, um, next, I'd like to um, very much warmly welcome our panel members. And I'll start uh, with Secretary uh, Humayun Kabir. Uh, he's from the Ministry of Railways uh, in the government of Bangladesh. Um, now, I'd very much like to warmly welcome him. He was appointed to his position uh, in December 2021 and has extensive experience in various ministries in Bangladesh. Uh, Dr. Kabir is also an expert in public-private partnerships for infrastructure projects and energy regulations. So please warmly welcome him. Uh, next, we have uh, further down the panel, we have Mr. Carlos uh, Ponte. Uh, Carlos is the head of environment, social and governance team uh, for a private sector company, Mazda, uh, which is leading the implementation of the Zarafshan 
uh, wind power project in Uzbekistan. So warm welcome to you. Uh, we also have to my left here uh, Salome uh, Susumia. Uh, she is the deputy chairperson from the Department of uh, Roads in Georgia's Ministry of Regional Development and Infrastructure. And as you'll see, she has extensive experience in dispute resolution, litigation, and arbitration cases, uh, and also working on large-scale projects with environmental law and IFI safeguards. So welcome. Uh, we're also pleased to have uh, in the middle of the panel uh, Linnea Wickstrom from uh, the Builders and Woodworkers International. Uh, she is a global director for construction, health and safety. Uh, and she's leading on the promotion of trade union development in the construction sector. Um, and she's also been collaborating with ADB over the last year. Actually, this time last year, we signed a memorandum of understanding about collaboration. So you'll hear a little bit more about that later. Uh, and then certainly, uh, last but not least, a uh, person who will be very familiar to many of you, uh, Imrana Jalal. She's ADB's Special Project Facilitator uh, as part of ADB's accountability mechanism, and she has been working to receive and solve uh, quite a number of complaints that we have through the mechanism. Uh, she is from Fiji, and uh, she was Fiji's first Human Rights Commissioner. Um, and in 2023, she received the Ruth Bader Ginsburg Medal of Honor for advancing gender equality and the rule of law, which I, I, I was really impressed to find out, Imrano, that was something I didn't know about you. So, um, so you see, we have a, a wonderful panel. We've got members of government, we have private sector, we have civil society, and also our problem solving. So I think it gives us an opportunity to share a lot of rich lessons. And of course, we have you uh, with many members of civil society and others joining us. So I hope you'll find this uh, an interesting conversation. Uh, now, before we get into the panel, we have a short video. Um, there's three projects that we'll be discussing uh, briefly during this session, uh, and you'll hear a little bit about this in the video. So if we can just cue that up, uh, we'll go to the video first. Thank you. From lush jungle landscapes in Bangladesh, to windswept desert plains in Uzbekistan, to snow-capped mountains in Georgia. ADB and his partners are committed to protecting people and the environment while developing projects that drive economic growth and increase regional connectivity. They do this while combating climate change with a clear vision for a sustainable and inclusive future. Let's look at three examples of how environmental and social safeguards are delivering better outcomes for people and the planet. A climate resilient railway in Bangladesh will fill a missing link in the Trans-Asia Railway Network, connecting Bangladesh with neighboring countries, improving regional connectivity and trade networks. To protect the region's biodiversity, the project designed and built the world's first elephant overpass. In addition, the project has constructed several wildlife underpasses and is in the process of installing cutting-edge artificial intelligence technology with thermal sensors and cameras to detect elephants and alert train operators in real time to prevent collisions. Vulnerable people resettled by the project received compensation combined with skills training in farming, sewing, mechanics and computers to help them build sustainable livelihoods. Badi porche bita sho ha gas gusala onek porche. Ei phokke rail line rail way theke amader kisu taka dise. Ei taka niye amra abar no tumba pe badi kor korsi. Amader ishe kante ke poshi kanchi ke ishe shela ikazir dorzi kazir. Ei tani ei sham share regulati ar kore ar ashe ashe log zone ro the ar kore kisu taka upar zon kore sham share kazil aga. In Uzbekistan. A wind power project uses artificial intelligence to protect endangered birds. Located near an ecologically sensitive area of the Kizilkum Desert, the project's planned 111 wind turbines pose a potential risk to endangered bird species, including the Egyptian vulture and the steppe eagle. To address this, a pioneering shutdown on demand technology will use artificial intelligence to track species in real time and automatically stop turbines when birds are in the risk zone. 
This wind project supports Uzbekistan's goal to boost renewable energy capacity and reduce reliance on fossil fuels. In Georgia, where harsh winters can isolate mountain communities for months at a time, a new road project will provide year-round access with a climate-resilient two-lane highway. This corridor connects Georgia to several neighboring countries, serving as a vital economic link for the region. The road will reduce traffic congestion and free villages from seasonal isolation, while balancing easier access to tourism sites with protection of cultural heritage. The project faced challenges early on with engaging stakeholders and addressing complaints. By hiring local community liaison and environmental officers, partnering with civil society organizations, supporting better environmental management, and improving its grievance management system, the project has begun to overcome these challenges. These enhancements can be mainstreamed in other projects. Environmental and social safeguards result in more inclusive, sustainable, and resilient development that benefits both people and the environment. Okay, so there you see three, I think, quite interesting and also challenging projects. Um, and I think something we're going to explore now in the panel is some of the challenges that they faced. I think they haven't been easy, um, and we're continuing to learn through them. Um, I'm going to start firstly by asking Secretary Kabir from Bangladesh. Um, as you saw on the video, uh, it's quite a challenge to work in some of these biodiverse landscapes and balance some of the needs for regional connectivity with protecting the very sensitive landscapes that you have in the Cox Bazar region. So can you talk a little bit about uh, the project and how it's dealt with some of these challenges? Um, thank you, Bruce. As um, you know that this uh, Dohajari Cox Bazar project is a long 104 kilometer uh, rail project. Uh, there are a lot of challenges, but um, mainly I'll focus on two key challenges that we had to encounter with. Uh, firstly, the first challenge was how to deal with uh, environmental and biodiversity issues. And secondly, but not the least, that how can we address or make a good balance between a stakeholder's interest? Because there are a lot of different kind of interests who have their own interest as well. So after Many technical uh, surveys and assessment, for example, camera taping uh, to record the number and the type of animals, we identified and confirmed that uh, the rail line will cross the Asian wild elephant routes, which they have been using for a for long time, generation after generation. You know that elephants usually follow the same routes uh, for, for a long time. So, as shown in the video, uh, we developed actually several innovative ways to protect elephants in particular for uh, not being hit so that they cannot hit with the train. So we built two underpasses, one overpass and an elephant uh, funnel fence so uh, they can follow that uh, particular dedicated funnel. And also we created water holes and uh, provided salt leaks because usually that kind of elephants, they actually drink saline type of water. And um, we also actually introduced imaging and sensor technology um, in the locomotive engines so that uh, uh, that can alert the drivers in advance uh, when all elephants are nearby so that uh, they can slow down or stop the train. So that was the first challenge. And uh, secondly, actually, the issue was uh, on the community side. And we found it very challenging to deal with many stakeholders. Uh, because culturally, you know that uh, Bangladesh is a country of uh, joint family structure, kind of. That when people love to live with their parents, grandparents, siblings uh, all together. So when we built this project, uh, that was the embankment was very high. 
So this project actually, in many cases, they completely divided the community into two different parts. So they go through in the middle of the a village or something like that. So we actually spent a quite a deal of good time uh, with consultation with the stakeholders, try to understand their needs, and we disclose the actually transparently, very openly, the possible impacts and benefits they are going to get. So. And also, actually, we develop a monitoring mechanism so that the team members can uh, follow whether the, this project is uh, uh, complying, uh, the compliances that is according to the safeguard policy. So that's it. Excellent. Thank you very much, Secretary Kabir. So, you know, firstly, I want to commend you. I mean, it's the first project in the world that has invested in an elephant overpass, which yeah. is truly impressive. That's the and, first kind of project, yeah. Um, so a lot of lessons to be learned from that. So, of course, the, the long-term monitoring will be very important to see how well that works. Uh, and also, you've mentioned stakeholder engagement, which we've heard a lot about uh, this week, you know, some of the challenges and also some of the weaknesses that need to be overcome in that. So I think it's a very interesting example. So thank you very much for sharing. Um, now next, I, I'd actually like to, if I can now, uh, call on uh, Salome Susumia. Uh, she, again, the deputy chairperson from the uh, roads department here in Georgia. Now, the uh, north-south corridor road project that you heard earlier about in the video, uh, there have been some concerns from affected people uh, through the project uh, implementation. And, and I think this is an area where you've worked consistently, uh, you know, developing enhanced stakeholder engagement, grievance mechanisms, and, and also another number of areas like cultural heritage. So could you tell us a little more about, uh, you know, the project and how, how you've addressed some of these issues and what the government's learned and, and perhaps applying in other contexts? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Bruce. Mm, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to say the happy Easter to all Orthodox attendees in uh, this session. Mm, uh, uh, it's very great honor to, for me to speak regarding this project, which was born seven years ago in my hands. I, period I was uh, in the roads department, then uh, it uh, implemented, it uh, developed, and uh, today we are implementing this project. Uh, this is the really remarkable project, uh, and the um, project sparked a great deal of interest uh, from the uh, affected people and uh, the other interested parties. And from the beginning of the project, uh, the early stage, uh, from the feasibility and feasibility, then detailed design, and uh, prior of the starting of the implementation, up to the 45 meaningful public consultation we have conducted uh, with the affected people and uh, other interested party. Uh, this uh, consultation become the rule of uh, the project during the development, uh, during the implementation, because we have the daily face-to-face -face communication, verbal written, small group, large group consultations with the locals and other interested parties. Uh, and we use this as an opportunity to improve the grievance uh, management uh, to, uh, through the other projects in Georgia. And uh, also the stakeholder engagement plan was developed to the, for this project and uh, a special so, a social specialist uh, was uh, dedicated for this project in the RD's internal team who had the uh, daily communication with the um, affected people who was providing them the um, uh, da project data information, maps, and who was supporting them the land registration and other issues. Uh, and also, I would like to mention that uh, this, um, uh, we have uh, uh, set up the fully furnished uh, informational center for the project. Uh, we are the all uh, information regarding the project is available. And community liaison officer was engaged, uh, who is field-based, who has the daily communication with the locals, and who is providing the verbal or written compliance, uh, and uh, we are addressing it through the uh, GRM. Uh, and uh, also, uh, I would like to underline that the project uh, has its uh, social media platforms. We are the all uh, information regarding the project is uploaded, and also the project has its web page. We are the all publicly available document uh, is uh, uploaded, and the any party, any third party, interested party, APs, and etc., have the opportunity to see the uh, information. I believe that this uh, really helped to try uh, to. 
build the trust with the community and uh, to uh, enable the honest and the correct sharing of the information. Of course, this uh, project is a uh, category A. It has a um, uh, category A project, and uh, from from the environmental side, we have uh, uh, this biodiversity, biodiversity surveys are being uh, conducted to preserve the wet meadows and other critical habitats such as uh, Egyptian vultures. And within the scope of the SAMP, uh, only for this project, 66 thematic and specific plans have been developed. And out of 66, 15 plans is addressing the preservation of the biodiversity. The well management and uh, the management documentation uh, has, uh, when it's management documentation uh, guarantees the uh, effective management of the environmental realm uh, by the project team. I would like to also mention that the project uh, from the beginning was uh, interesting from the cultural point of view and uh, because the valley is rich with the cultural heritage sites and etc. The project has a compre comprehensive uh, cultural heritage assessment and based on the intensive and extensive surveys, the cultural heritage general action plan was prepared which is open and publicly available for the uh, people and uh, the field-based cultural heritage monitors we engaged who are supervising and looking for the construction activities to, uh, on the site during the construction activities. Uh, this uh, well management and uh, documented uh, approach uh, on uh, the environmental field, on the social part, on the cultural heritage part, I believe that is uh, one of the best international practice who can, which can be shared by the other countries also. And uh, at the end, in conclusion, I would like to underline that uh, the transparency, openness, uh, also the uh, proactive measures and uh, uh, the uh, Sincere approach uh, can uh, uh, bring us uh, the trust to the project, project team, uh, and uh, avoid the complaints. Mm. Thank you, Bruce. Mm. Very good. Thank you very much, Salome. And, you know, I think what you've laid out there is also, you know, over time, uh, you've had to adapt to a number of challenges. And so you've developed additional action plans and, and the community liaison, for example. Just briefly, is that something that... Um, you had done in other projects with that sort of community uh, liaison approach? Uh, no, this was the first time when we have engaged the community liaison officer who had the daily communication. Uh, this is the third independent external party who has this daily communication with the locals who is bringing us uh, the, uh, their voice also. Uh, and uh, um, what we have done in this project to improve this management system every week on Monday, we have this call to brief off about the ongoing situation in the project during the week. Okay, great. Okay, so something we can we can pick up and apply in other projects as well. Fantastic. Um, so next, um, the third project that you saw on the video was uh, from Uzbekistan, the Sarafshan uh, wind power project. So now if I might be able to turn to you, uh, Carlos from Mazda. Um, you know, a similar question. Could you tell us about, you know, some of the challenges that you faced uh, in the project and, and briefly some of the lessons learned? Sure. Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here today with all of you. Um, as it was mentioned in the video, the key challenge that we faced at Sarafshan was the presence of protected raptor species. Uh, wind power projects can cause uh, morbidity or mortality of bird species due to collisions with turbines. So in Sarafshan specifically, to address that risk, we have deployed a system, Identiflight, that uses cameras to detect birds when they are flying and uses artificial intelligence to identify the species and to identify the flight path. So when it's moving towards the turbines, it will automatically shut the turbine down. And this system, it's, it's already proven to be, it has been studied in peer-reviewed publications, and it's proven to be a lot more effective than the traditional approach that is to have observers with a walkie-talkie and binoculars, right? So we have 100% coverage. Actually, this system has been implemented in the US, in Australia, and in Europe, and very few projects have 100% coverage. We do. All of our turbines are covered by identified units. And um, there are two aspects of the management in Sarafshan that are also interesting in relation to biodiversity. One of them is that we have created a scientific advisory board where we invite international experts, international ornithological experts, independent from the project company, and NGOs like BirdLife International that have a lot of knowledge about um, the management of bird species. 
and they will review all the performance documentation from the project and, when necessary, provide additional recommendations as an adaptive management approach to protect bird species. The second interesting aspect of deploying identified is that every second of every minute of every day for 25 years, we have hundreds of cameras recording and plotting bird movement. So we are going to have a huge amount of information, an unprecedented amount of information, already in a digital format on the behavior of this species within the entire project area that is quite large. So we are quite excited, together with the Scientific Advisory Board, to analyze this information and contribute to scientific knowledge uh, on, in this field. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Carlos. Uh, I think it's really interesting also to see that increasing use of technology. We heard already from, from Bangladesh with the sensor technology for the railway, uh, also now here with wind power tracking birds. Um, I wanted to ask you, though, just very briefly, um, something we were just talking about uh, before we came on stage was, of course, there's a number of wind power projects that are being proposed in Uzbekistan. And uh, beyond your project, we were talking about the use of strategic environmental assessment. Could you just touch on that, you know, the need to sort of look more widely at the landscape? Yes, of course. Uh, our project was undertaken before there was a strategic environmental assessment for the entire country, right? And that's very challenging because when we do an environmental and social impact assessment, we have limitations in terms of technology comparison or site selection. Typically, the government gives you the site. So the ADB and other lenders are currently working on a strategic assessment for the entire country, which is extremely valuable for the next projects that will come up. And one of the important lessons learned is that as the energy transition starts in new countries, it would be ideal if the strategic environmental and social assessment is done from day one, supporting the national government to understand that need and doing that strategic assessment that will, send, they will then de risk the projects that will come later when private sector comes in with environmental and social impact assessments. Thank you. I mean, it's a great point. It's something that we also see at the ADB that, you know, when we come in at a, an individual project level, uh, when you're missing that information, obviously, it's hard to make strategic decisions. So it's something that we'd very much like to promote. So, yeah, thank you for highlighting that. Uh, so next, I, I'd like to, uh, Linnea, and, and thank you very much for, for being here. You were in Manila with us just, you know, a week ago. Uh, so Builders and Woodworkers International, you've been working uh, to provide us with comments on our policy, pushing us there, but also looking at some projects um, and seeing how the performance at the site level is going. Can you tell us a little bit about Sure, yes. So, as you mentioned, we signed the MOU last year, and since we have done uh, project inspections in three countries, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Philippines, and specifically, this, we covered some small projects additional to these that I'm going to mention, where we went to the Rupsha power plant in Bangladesh, Tanahu hydropower plant in Nepal, and the Malalas Clark railway in the Philippines. And I think it's been a really good experience in the sense of, okay, there's real, real challenges on the ground. And I think that's something that might have been realized also by the safeguards team. I think something we will talk about the safeguard development later on, but because there hasn't been a labor safeguard, you can also see that the safeguard team haven't had the capacity to monitor these things. So it's really been a learning curve also for the safeguards team, I think. Um, and there's been very severe findings, I must say, on the project sites, everything from uh, labor accommodation that's uh, from subcontractors that's had more than 20 people living in tents in 60 degrees heat in the Philippines, to uh, in Nepal, we had three near misses during just one day of inspection. So health and safety of these projects are severe. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to mention three specific topics that reoccur on each of these projects. And uh, the first one, which often gets forgotten when we talk about health and safety, is the use of extensive overtime. This is standard in construction. Um, on, at least in Bangladesh and Nepal, we had on both of the projects people working up to 12 hours a day for seven days a week, with just five days off per year for uh, holidays. So what does this mean? Okay, we didn't have a labor safeguards. It does break the national laws uh, on overtime, but also it's a safety risk. 
with exhausted workers, you're going to have fatalities. And I think this is a topic we really need to start discussing within project implementation, because it comes from already from project planning on is the timeline feasible, but also things like shift work. If you're going to have shift work to have nighttime, yeah, then eight hours goes three times in a day or 24 hours instead of thinking about two shifts. Two shifts is automatic and then that you reach 12 hours. So this is something really that's been on every project. That's something we've been discussing. Um, just quickly, two other things. Work accommodation, I think, is something everyone thinks, oh, but I even heard from a, a consultant the other week. Yeah, but you should see how people live in the Philippines civilly by themselves. So why do you put so much pressure on us to provide worker accommodation? And I think this is something we really need to address. The culture of discussing the dignity of the workers we have on site and making sure that they are safe uh, and healthy to be able to perform work. Because if we don't have that, we can have as fancy projects as we want, but people will suffer and that's not development. So I think we really need to discuss what is development and what kind of work do we provide. Um, lastly, because I am from the trade unions, um, I also want to raise the key of having workers representation when we talk about uh, right now, with the new ILO core conventions of health and safety, um, there is now an international uh, rule or regulation that there should be workers' representation on health and safety committees. And this is something we've been discussing on every project site, because there, there is health and safety committees, but it's managers talking with themselves about how to change. And really to have any impact and any trickle down on discussions on improving and also to hear from the ground up because what we talk about often in these projects is stakeholder engagement etc but we often forgot forget that the workers on the project the laborers are one of the most important stakeholders the ones that's actually the most affected by the projects so i think that's what we really learned from uh, visiting the sites Thank you very much, Linnea. So obviously, um, a lot of significant challenges that need to, to be overcome there. Um, I mean, I think one of the reasons for us to put more effort into this and the development of a labour standard is to try and you know, really shine a light on this. And when we've spoken to governments across the region, as we've been doing over the last year, they'll all say, look, we've got good uh, laws. Well, many of them have uh, good legal frameworks, but the implementation is a challenge and they don't have the resources. But, but I think there's a whole th range of actions that need to be taken across uh, you know, the spectrum from, from the policy, the design, the implementation, monitoring, working with contractors. So maybe we'll come back to that a little bit later in the next part of the session on some of the things that need to be done. But it's a really important issue. I want to acknowledge that. Um, so thank you very much for highlighting those. Um, now, next, so, so we're hearing some of the challenges. And uh, Imran Jalal, so you're actually at the forefront of this with the uh, problem solving. And um, I mean, it's been, a, I think, a very important function in the ADB because you come in and work uh, between affected people, uh, sometimes with civil society representing them, uh, and work with the government executing agencies on solving problems. What are you seeing? What, what are some of the critical challenges we're facing? Thank you, Bruce. But before I answer your question, I just want to congratulate you on the fact that somehow you've achieved this perfectly gender-balanced panel. <laughs> so you're, 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 you've followed through with ADB policy, and it's such a pleasure to be part of a panel where there's perfect gender balance. Um, it should always be this way. Absolutely, perfect gender balance Bruce. Society. But I just Thank wanted you. to point that out. In, in particular, I attended a session two days ago hosted by WWF, which was a one and a half hour panel discussion in two parts, and there were eight men and one woman. So that for me is not acceptable. Um, and so it's lovely to be part of an ADB panel where we're doing the right thing. Now, the um, full disclosure of the three projects that were talked about today, we are dealing with complaints against two of them. Um, so 
that is something that is important. No matter how good a project is, um, there tends to be complaints. And, and it, for example, in the Georgia Transport Project, it's a linear project, long road. Naturally, it attracts complaints because there's lots of different people along the road who, who might be affected. So some of the challenges of these projects are, and in the Uzbekistan wind farm matter, um, it's thrown up this very interesting dilemma, which is, Biodiversity is a public good. Everybody has an investment in it. Our policy kind of limits complainants to people who are directly affected and living in the locality. Now, your project is out in the wop wops, as they say in Australia, and um, there's no necessarily people living in the area who can prove a direct impact. So what does that mean for the Egyptian vultures? Can the people living in the next country, in Kazakhstan, for example, complain? So that, that's a very, very interesting challenge. And that also applies to climate change, right? Climate change is a public good. How does a complainant prove that he or she is directly affected by an ADB project? How, you know, what is the level of evidence that we will be looking at in terms of asking for a reasonable level of, of evidence. So, and proving that direct link of project and harm, I think is a, is a very significant challenge. And one more point, which is um, over the last 10 years, we've done research which shows that 41% of our project uh, complainants ask for confidentiality. The basis of which they say is potential retaliation via the project. So that also presents a significant risk. How do we provide access to justice for people who don't even want to write their name in a complaint form because they're scared about retaliation? So I think I'll just leave that there. I don't have answers for these, but I just wanted to respond to the question of what are the challenges we're facing. Thank you, Bruce. Great, thank you very much, Imrana. And um, you know, I can see one of the uh, questions, I'm just looking already at uh, the pigeonhole and some of the questions that are coming through. I think one of the questions we'll come to later that seems to be getting a lot of interest is, you know, where we've had those complaints, how did they actually contribute to developing a better project? So we'll come back to that uh, a little bit later. Um, but I also want to acknowledge you mentioned about the request for confidentiality, and we're seeing that more and more. Uh, and certainly concerns uh, in some regions uh, about you know, potential retaliation and how we deal with that. And I think that is a, a very important issue that we need to address moving forward. So thank you very much. So we've, we've been talking about some of the project experiences. And um, next, um, before we go to a, a wider discussion with the audience, and please do keep putting things into the pigeonhole. I, I'm already seeing quite a lot of things coming through there. But um, before we do that, I wanted to come back to our panel members um, and ask a little bit, taking a pivot now, we do have the draft of the new environmental and social framework. And we are still um, uh, been doing a lot of consultations this week. Uh, actually, comment period uh, for written comments is actually closing on the 6th of May. So if you'd like to send in comments, please do. Um, but I'd like to take the opportunity to try and get a little bit of feedback from our panel members. Um, and I'd like to come back to the panel and, and ask now, you know, do you have any recommendations uh, for us? And um, I'm going to start, uh, I think, let me just see, maybe Imrana, seeing you were just, you know, last up, talking about some of those challenges. Uh, can I come to you? You know, would there be any key recommendations looking at what we've got in the policy draft at the moment that you think need further enhancements? Yes, so um, I think that the new environmental and social framework is an improvement in, in, in many ways. Um, some of the recurrent issues that keep coming up with the complaints uh, are not necessarily confined to the two complaints here, but, it, but these issues have come up. One is this issue of has the project team and the borrower government or company given sufficient attention to alternative design? This is a requirement in the ESF, in the old ESF as well as the new ESF. And we're finding, for example, I'll just think of one quick example to demonstrate what I mean. We dealt with a project recently where there was a land take of 40 hectares for a water treatment plant. Now, when the complaint came to us, 
there was a, the, 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 the borough was adamant that they had to take the 40 acres. Now, when we went back and hired an independent consultant, because we're independent ac accountability mechanism, we have the authority to hire independent accountants that are not accountants, experts, that are not ADB staff. And he told us that, in fact, we could actually build that WTP with, under, with, with 25 acres quite well. So when we went back to the PMU and said, look, our consultant expert says that can be done in 25 acres, the government department said, okay, they were very, re they were very receptive. So the question is, why didn't we give attention to that at the beginning to avoid the whole complaint? So that's, that's one of the recurrent things. We need to give sufficient attention to the analysis of the alternatives. Great point, great point. I've been hearing this as well during the week as some of the conversations that we've been having, so strengthening alternatives analysis. Um, it, next, I'd like to turn to uh, Secretary Kabir and, and uh, Deputy Chairperson Salome. When we've been doing consultations with governments, uh, we hear recognition that the safeguards are really important and they do add value to, to projects. Uh, but we've also heard about you know, the challenges and sometimes the transaction costs. Um, Yet, while well, we, we strive for more ambition, but implementation is still very challenging. So I wanted to ask you, uh, do you have any perspectives and any recommendations for us? Um, firstly, I thank uh, ADB for this such a this safeguard policy. Definitely, it helps minimizing environmental and social impacts upfront. So that can reduce the transaction cost, of course. But as the panel members mentioned, and it's come up with the compliance and other things, just uh, uh, she mentioned about the, what we found that uh, when we go for implementation of the projects, now the effective people ask for underpass and overpasses because they are completely divided in because of this project. But it was not come up with the feasibility study or detailed design. Mm -hmm. So it has to consider you know, during the feasibility study, the, how can we actually address the compliances. So need to provide training the project teams, uh, also the government, that these are our the, uh, policies. But I do understand that uh, one size doesn't fit all because the compliances which are uh, relevant for a particular country may not be relevant to other countries as well. So we have to consider the social cultural context and other surrounding as well. So, and also I think we do need to uh, be flexible, need to show respect the local culture you know, for this subset policy. Thank Very you. good, thank you. So yes, of course, the nature of development in Bangladesh versus in Georgia is different. And of course, the, the approach that we need to take in say stakeholder engagement will be different. So great points, thank you. Um, Salome, your perspective? Uh, thank you, Bruce. Uh, good question, uh, because uh, uh, ADB's SPS policy is not used only uh, by the roads department, only the ADB finance project. We are using the IFS safeguards policies uh, on the project, which is financed by the government of Georgia also. And uh, the new safeguard policy is more comprehensive than the existing one. Uh, I believe that uh, the perception of the government and understanding what the DB is requesting uh, from him uh, uh, it will be more clear because there is a, some uh, general wording, some statements uh, which need additional clarifications. But uh, I would like to raise the uh, several, I would like to uh, raise this some points which I think that is an important improvement in the policy. Uh, first of all, the cultural heritage part, which we in, in the existing SPS policy, we have only the one sentence regarding the cultural heritage. I have seen the whole chapter now in the new SPS. Uh, and I believe that uh, this uh, new chapter is following the steps which you have taken in the project. And I believe that the, our project, KK project, has contributed on the drafting of this part. Uh, I have seen the uh, temporal land taken part, which was not considered in the SPS policy, and uh, I believe that also the Kvashati Kobe project has contributed on this part. Uh, and the important part is the stakeholder engagement chapter. Uh, we are, there is a uh, more consultation requirement, and etc., which uh, in, will ensure the transparency and um, confidence from the interested parties. 
uh, I would like to underline the climate change part, uh, which is the new assessments for the, uh, some countries, uh, and uh, this is the more, more extensive um, uh, requirements is uh, provided in the policy. Uh, we are doing this uh, under the requirement of the legislation in our EAS, but uh, this will be significant improvement. Uh, the livelihood restoration, uh, which was addressed in the, the new ESF, uh, and uh, this, uh, uh, this um, uh, new um, uh, statement in the, the safeguard policy will make the clearance what is the livelihood uh, restoration and the, what is the livelihood improvement and how they are differ from each other. Because uh, the statement in the existing policy is uh, very general, and uh, uh, it can be uh, it, it, it can be clarified with a different manner, and it's more subjective uh, sometimes. Uh, and uh, I would like to highlight the uh, some uh, uh, strengthening of the role of the national legislation and best international practice, also using the other IFIS policies uh, during the implementation if it is not covered by the ADB's new ESF. Uh, 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 but I think that uh, when you're, you have the bad, uh, good uh, international uh, practice in your country, whether this can be, uh, can be considered as a uh, compliance with the new policy, it should be determined. Uh, in the, uh, uh, due to this time issues, uh, I have pointed out the main issues, what I think Thank that uh, is important in the new policy. But for the, in the frame of the consultations, I will be happy to provide the more details. Uh, regarding the comments. Great, thank you very much. That, that's really helpful. And I can tell you're also putting your lawyer's hat on there and looking in some of the fine details, which is really important. And, and I think we, we hear from you around the need for clarity. And I'm also hearing that as we have some discussions with other stakeholders like civil society. What does this mean? We have to be very clear. So that, that's very well taken. Um, now, um, I want to go to... Um, uh, first, I think maybe Carlos for a private sector perspective, and then we'll come to, to Linnea for some of your views again from uh, BWI. Carlos, you know, private sector, do um, you have any views on policy or, or perhaps on how it can be better implemented? Yes, so I would share maybe three suggestions on policy and implementation. Um, the first one is what I highlighted before on the strategic assessments, right? And this links to the analysis of alternatives. There are many alternatives in terms of technology, uh, site selection, even installed capacity that are decided at the government level. So there, DFIs have a really good position to work with the government to streamline environmental and social aspects early on. Um, the second aspect that I would like to highlight is a streamlining with other DFIs. Because even though uh, safeguards and standards and performance requirements are at many levels already broadly aligned, when we have small misalignments in the details and in the practical implementation, that can bring a complication for transactions to move forward, right? And we have things like disclosure periods that are misaligned or definitions along biodiversity, priority biodiversity features. It would be very interesting if uh, different DFIs could um, align better on those aspects, it would be helpful. And the last aspect that I would like to highlight relates to, um, let me give you a bit of context. In Mazdar, we have projects that are DFI funded and projects that are not DFI funded, right? So we have compared the performance between both. And we find that lenders involvement, ADB's involvement is very helpful. So it means that we have experts that come and review our ESIA in a lot of detail, give us a lot of feedback, strong expertise, then we have an additional level of supervision through the lender ENS advisor and the lenders themselves doing their own audits and site visits. So we find that there is an improved performance. That is typically focused on five topics. Biodiversity, worker rights and worker welfare. In ADB projects, specifically gender, we always get a lot of valuable comments and joint initiatives on gender with ADB. And I would say as well... Um, PS2 aspects, PS5, PS6, well, those are the key topics. More recently, supply chain has become a very important topic for renewable energy, right? Um, however, we also find that on other topics, there is less expertise and there is less uh, meaningful supervision. And these include occupational health and safety. And it includes as well community health and safety aspects like traffic. 
In renewables, we have very short construction periods, maybe nine months, where we get a lot of PV panels delivered to the site or huge turbines, right? So traffic is a key risk. And we find that all lenders, EBRD, IFC, ADB, deploy very strong teams on environmental and social aspects that probably are not as strong in these key topics. And then our teams inadvertently focus on those aspects where we get more lender comments and have less of a focus on these OHS and community health and safety aspects. So my suggestion would be to strengthen capacity or even deploy experts during the construction phase of renewable energy projects on these specific topics. Thank you very much, Carlos. And I, I think there's some great points there. I, I'll just note the, the need for harmonization, greater harmonization, and I think that's a topic that's been coming up a lot. But I want to use your point that you made uh, around labour and health and safety. It's a good segue then to, to turn straight over to uh, Linnea. Thank you. Look, we are aligned, private sector and trade unions. Don't think that we're always fighting. Um, no, but I think you make a very good point, uh, the healthy, health and safety aspect. When we started the safeguard review, um, which has now been a very long process, bros, um, true, true. the health and safety wasn't a fundamental right. And I think that's actually something we can consider, looking at what are the aspects that's really been brought in to these fundamental rights, because we can have the bar higher. And when everyone says like, oh, streamline the DFIs, I always get a bit scared because that always means look at IFC, <laughs> which is not the top of the class. EBRD is, has much higher safeguards. So let's look at the top of the DFIs if we're going to streamline instead of just streamline with IFC, which is usually what happens. Um, and then looking back to the points I made earlier on what we've seen on projects, EBRD in their new safeguard policy that was, uh, or their draft launched a couple of weeks ago, has brought up both the health and safety committees. They brought in psychosocial risks and extensive overtime, which is in construction one of the highest risks actually. People think it's minor. But in many countries, there's more likelihood of a construction worker committing suicide than having a fatal accident at work, because it's a really high risk when it comes to psychosocials. And then also additional requirements on workers' accommodation has been seen in the EBRD policy. So, okay, let's streamline, but then let's do it towards the top. Um, then I just want to mention also when it comes to the environmental and social impact assessments, because we've heard it raised here, I've read many of these impact assessments and I can't say how many times I get shocked how many pages there are about birds, <laughs> but always just one paragraph of labor impact and that risk. It says uh, it will be an increased risk of HIV because of migrants and that will have some kind of implication for the communi community. So I think what we really need to see is what is involved in an environmental impact uh, assessment for labor. What is the risks? What is the health and safety risks? What is the traffic risks, etc.? What, because, I, and that comes back yes to the last point of what is stakeholder engagement? Because many forget to involve labor because when you do an assessment, the workers are not there already. So who do you? consult with. And there I think you really need to start looking at what does the national trade unions, global trade unions, what role do they have in environmental impacts assessment before? Because they are the labor experts, they are the stakeholders, and they are the ones that will be able to give these risks. Um, so just concluding on that, and you will know what my last point is, is also because I have to say it, is to make a concrete uh, reference to the ILO's core conventions. That is missing currently in the safeguards and we really need to tie those things together because it comes back also to tying together the DFIs, different safeguards. If, if we get in the core conventions at least, then there's a common uh, way of analyzing it. There's so much things that comes behind just the reference like that. There's a lot of work behind. There's a lot of guidance notes from ILO that can be used. So uh, those are my points. Thank you. Thank you. Very good points and very well articulated. And um, 
You know, I, I think across all of those, we need to come back and look at the policy, but also the implementation. I think one thing that we've been missing uh, is really a strong focus on labour management plans and the assessment and stakeholder engagement around those. So uh, thank you. And definitely well noted on the, uh, the reference to the ILO. So we'll look further at that. Now, um, we've We've had good conversations. We've heard a lot from you know different perspectives uh, here on the panel. Um, I want to bring us back. We're a little bit uh, short on time. Unfortunately, we only we're given an hour for this session, so it makes it a little hard for uh, Q and A. I, I am looking at the um, the chat, and actually, the question in the chat at the moment that's got the most votes is towards ADB. And um, I want to address that just very briefly, but without spending too long, because I want to hear from our panel members as well. Um, the, the, so the first question that I'll just pick up is, will the new ADB safeguards go beyond existing safeguards of MDBs and align with international human rights laws? That, that's, that's the first part of the question. So I, just really briefly, I want to highlight there that um, we are looking at the benchmarking with other MDBs and certainly with a perspective to upwards harmonisation or even you know, going beyond. Uh, EBRD, as you said, Linnea, has just come out with their new draft and we're, we're looking at that as well before we finalise ours. On human rights, we've recognised the real importance of us supporting our developing member countries to realise their commitments on human rights. We're also working to embed very clear um, elements of human rights, for example, around gender or child labour, forced labour, um, other aspects, specifically in the policy so that we can then link it to legal requirements for our borrowers. So that's really important. But one new thing that we've got in the policy draft, and, and this may not have come out clearly to everyone, is a contextual risk analysis, which we did not have before. And this contextual analysis will enable us to look at uh, some human rights dimensions. For example, are there the conditions for uh, meaningful stakeholder engagement in a country that would be you know, without intimidation, without coercion, can people speak up? So, so we are building in some of these elements and I'm happy to talk to many of you more on those, those points. There's also some other comments there for ADB about climate and I'm happy to, to talk more, but what I'd wanna pick up on is some of the others that were uh, directed towards some of our panel members. Uh, particularly, I'll start with um, Secretary Kabir. There's a question here in the chat that says, for the project in Bangladesh, how was the engagement with affected indigenous peoples? Um, and what were some of the challenges encountered? Do you have any perspectives on, on that side? It's very important, of course, uh, you know, in the Cox Bazaar region of uh, Bangladesh. Um, as I uh, mentioned earlier, that uh, we actually took a different approach because rather than, I know, subject policy, rather than a top-down approach, we took bottom-up approach. That's, that's why we dealt with a um, a huge amount of uh, time to, for consultation with the stakeholders. Indigenous people, uh, as you said, of course, we did consult uh, with them and took measures because, and accordingly, actually, there were cases that we had to slightly actually um, uh, change the, our design in, in, in some cases uh, for their benefit because we, we disclosed the impacts and the benefits and possible impacts of this project. I think that was actually helpful that on time we have successfully completed this project. Thank you, thank you very much. And, and I think one of the aspects that also comes out in um, you know, some of the, the projects with indigenous peoples that we've been hearing is um, the stakeholder engagement and free power informed consent. Is that? Yep. So trust building is very important, you know? Okay. Trust building. And of course, you mentioned uh, culturally appropriate earlier, so I think that's, that's very important. Um, the next question I, I wanted to direct to you, Salome. Um, again, this had come up, um, you know, how did the accountability mechanism findings uh, around the project, which did identify some areas that were non-compliant with our policy, um, you know, how did that play a role in making it a better project? And, and essentially, how have you addressed those? And I just, just briefly, I know it's a big topic, yeah, uh, it's big topic, uh, topic uh, and I will be very brief. Uh, uh, there was a lot of lessons learned, uh, not only the roads department, but also uh, the ADV has learned a lot from this project. Uh, this has improved uh, the some uh, ESF also. This uh, project has contributed uh, uh, in the ESF party also because there is an improvement in the policy based on the practice which we had. Also, it was uh, the management action plan was well managed. 
uh, and uh, the issues which was raised was uh, promptly responded. Uh, the uh, staff was fully dedicated on the project uh, and uh, to address the all non-compliances which was identified. And at the end of the day, uh, it, uh, uh, the sum of the uh, recommendations also has impact on the livelihood of the people. There was uh, some improvements on the training part, support and etc. Uh, and uh, I believe that uh, these lessons learned can be a uh, sub subject for the uh, subject of uh, the uh, good practice for the other projects which we are going to implement in Georgia. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, obviously a lot of lessons that you mentioned before. Actually, I wanted to note um, directly. For example, the lessons on cultural heritage did influence very much the development of that new standard. So we, you know, we're trying to turn the lessons learned, the experience, back into the better policy. Um, now, I want to just take a couple of minutes, um, we, we're one minute over time, just to, to touch on some of the other questions that were there. Uh, for the Zarafshan project, um, Carlos, I'll just turn to you briefly. Um, so there's some issues around uh, conflicts with nesting birds. Um, and I think the question here does, does sort of push it back on you, says Mazda's refused to adjust the site, um, but birds cannot submit complaints. So, you know, which you've got, maybe, maybe that's one reason why sometimes there's a strong section on birds. <laughs> we, we're giving attention. But yeah, do you have any perspectives on that? I, I know the siding of the, of the towers is challenging. Um, you know, how would you respond to that? And is there any scope still to, to adjust or improve monitoring to minimize impacts? Yes, sure. So we have additional and enhanced mitigation measures on those areas where turbines are close to nests, like avoiding the construction during specific months uh, when the, um, in the, during the reproduction uh, season, right, for birds. We also have different options, enhanced number of uh, identified units. So even compared to what we disclosed in the ESIA, we now have additional identified units to further the risk those areas. And we have an adaptive management scope, right? We have engaged with some NGOs proactively, like with BirdLife International, with other NGOs, uh, because they share their concern with us. And we have also engaged and organized site visits with them so that they can see how we are managing these aspects. It is a challenge. We need adaptive management. We don't have of the solutions from day one. We have optimized the site a lot in terms of moving turbines around. Uh, we have constraints on all sides and constraints with the government, right? So, yeah, that's how we have addressed it. Okay, thank you. And, and I think you were saying before also with the data, we need continuous monitoring and, and to adjust and to adjust the management of the turbines around that. So, so thank you very much. Now, um, time's not on our side here, but um, I do want to just come to one other question. Um, or, you know, perhaps two. That I'll, I'll mention at the end, there was, I think the top-ranked question is about ADB as a climate bank. So maybe when I wrap up, I'll just mention on that. Um, but there's a really important one here which we've not really covered. Um, it's underrepresented groups. And, and we do recognise in the new policy the need to look more closely at disadvantaged and vulnerable communities, including people with disabilities. So the question says, how is meaningful engagement of underrepresented groups such as people with disabilities and represent, representatives uh, representative organisations ensured through the ESF and through the accountability mechanism. Now, um, that, that's, you know, maybe challenging to answer in its totality, but I was going to ask you, um, you know, Imrana, is this something that you've been seeing, you know, um, focus in projects enough on people with disabilities or other uh, disadvantaged and vulnerable groups? So, it's a, it's a good question. We, as far as I know, we've not had any direct complaint involving groups like that. We do have complaints, a lot of complaints from, from indigenous peoples, of course, mm. um, but not like that. The only thing I can think of is in my former job at the inspection panel at the World Bank, we dealt with um, a complaint by LGBTQI++ people in Nepal who felt that a World Bank project was denying them access to TVET training because of the way the advertisement was put out for people to apply. And when LGBTQI people were applying for participation in the TVET project, they were being rejected. So we started out this process and halfway through the process, 
the project and the government capitulated and decided to allow the, this group in. It was, they were the Blue Diamond Society, they were called. Interesting name. So that's the only example I can think of. Okay, thank you very much. But it's a really critical issue. Brian, your hand's up, you're sitting at the front. I'll, I'll give you the floor um, and then we might move to a, a wrap up. We are over time, so yeah. So, I mean, you um, can't have a conversation on safeguards if you're not going to listen to civil society. Yes, so. yes, absolutely. So, yeah, you guys, I think everybody's heard me enough. I'll pass it on to my colleague, Dewi, uh, just for a few words from ours. Okay. Thank you. Very short. No, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Glad uh, you're here. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all uh, panelists. Before I uh, raise our concern, uh, let me call my Media India, Mayang, Philippine, and Silva, Armenia to show our banner and all our colleagues to open your jacket, uh, remove your so, uh, uh, shawl, and show your t shirt. Yeah? Show your t shirt because we have the message for the ADB. Thank you uh, once again. Um, we are the from Civil Society would like to raise our concern regarding the ESF. Two years, the consultation process. We participate and submitted online and offline. And thus, in the last ESF W paper, doesn't reflect our main concern. One, too many flexible words. For example, materially consistent, timely and where applicable applied in case of a risk assessment, borrowing system and environment, uh, information disclosure. Second, the, ES, uh, the ESF diluted SPS 1995 in terms of gender language. For example, lacking consideration to female-headed household. The, the other Many experience show that uh, ADB project like the geothermal in Indonesia, large hydropower Tanahu in Nepal, Impal Road in India, and others, that the safeguard requirement were not implemented fully. So you have to ensure that the new ESF will be implemented fully. And the last, we urging ADB to rewrite with all binding requirement from our common, uh, comment and submission and make sure the new ASF must be strongly with gender language. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So thank you very much to civil society colleagues. I'm glad you're here and we respect you're here. Uh, We've had a lot of opportunities for engagement this week and we've heard many comments. Um, thank you very much. Um, we'll just very soon have to make this space available for another room, so if you wouldn't mind to just take your seats again so we can close the session out, respectfully for everyone else. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we've had some really good conversations today. It's great to hear the perspective of civil society, um, very important inputs that you've received from us. And I think moving forward, we're looking to uh, receive your written submissions, I think, uh, within the next week. We had a discussion yesterday around that. And we're looking forward to working through that as we finalise the policy. So I think it's a really good way to, to hear from you. Uh, we've also heard from governments. Uh, we've heard from the private sector and also from our uh, accountability mechanism. We'll have to wrap up in a minute. I'm just going to ask each of our panel members, perhaps, you know, reflections on the session, maybe reflections also on what you've heard. In one quick, you know, uh, one sound bite, if you have a final reflection and then we'll close. Thank you. What I could say that um, involving different stakeholders can raise awareness, promote sense of ownership, and improve cooperation when integrating biodiversity friendly measures into your projects. So that's thank you. Great. Involving stakeholders. Exactly. So thank you. Uh, Salome. 
<laughs> exactly the same. I would like to say that uh, the involvement of the all stakeholders, the listen of the people uh, and the affected people is very important for the project implementation. Speaking not as a um, supervisor of the social and environmental team, also the, as a lawyer who is dealing with the claim management under the contract, the implementation of the social and environmental parts and the well uh, uh, documented uh, uh, records, having the well documented records and also the communication, consultation, etc., is important not to delay itself the project. Because as uh, in my practice, uh, the ground for the extension of type of completion or, or the excusable ground for the contractors is always the social part or the environmental access to the sites, this is the major issue why we are, the projects are delayed. They have all the stakeholder engagements, assessments, uh, and uh, the transparency, openness, sensor is the most important part to deliver the project on time. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Linnea, a final word? Yes, first, uh, thank you and solidarity with our CSO colleagues. Um, I think it is very important to close the process to make the solid, a solid uh, safeguard policy, but also to make the investments to be able to implement it. And I think this is something that we really need to bring forward also, is make sure that it's not a policy on paper, but actually that meets the projects. Because to me, and that's why we cooperate with the ADB on these projects specific, is to say, it doesn't matter even if you say that only national laws applies. If the national laws are not even met on the project, you can put in however high policy you want. But if it's not reflected on the ground, we don't really need the paper. <laughs> That's my perspective. But that doesn't undermine the point of the civil society that we really want a strong policy. So thank you, but really make the effort to make it put into practice. Great. Thank you very much, Carlos, and then Imrana, and we'll, we'll move to class. Thank you. Okay, so I will share uh, just a quick example relevant to the point that was just made, right? Last week, we had a consultant telling us, advising us um, on a net gain requirement on biodiversity for another project to go for the when possible caveat on the performance standards. And that's a problem, right? We, we told them it was not acceptable because there is land available, the government could provide land, the species, it was viable. But the consultants and developers and private sector as well sometimes can try to find the easiest path, right? And push lenders to, to try to get them to accept that. So it's important that on all those wordings there is enough clarification. What does timely mean? What does when possible mean? So that there is a level playing field and we achieve that level of performance. Thank you. Imrana. Thank you, Bruce. Because you've only given me a sound bite, I just want you all to look at that owl. So that's what PIUs, project implementation units, often look like when I ask them if they've considered the alternative design. <laughs> a, a bit startled. <laughs> that's the line. <laughs> That's the lighter note. On a more serious note, That's a good one. convey to our borrowers, whether private sector or public sector, is that ESS requirements are mandatory. They're not discretionary. If you want our financing at very, very preferential interest rates, you need to understand that not only you, but we also have an investment in the rights of the people in your country. And so these safeguards are to protect. ADB and the people who are your beneficiaries. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Great final points from civil society from the panel. I'll end by saying it takes all voices to deliver good development. And I think we've heard a lot of good voices from the audience, sorry, from the audience today and from our panel. So I would thank everyone for their time today, all of you, and uh, you know, wish you good health and safe travels home. Thank you very much.